Hello everyone and welcome back to my Beyond History series in Kerbal Space Program 1.1.3. I have decided to edit some of our craft based on the information I got from the re-entry testing. And so in some cases I reduced the amount of ablator, in some cases increased the amount of ablator. And so those are the edits currently underway right now. And uh, so those missions are all not available for launch obviously. The UDMH depot there uh, will be available in 5 hours. So not too long, but we do have a Mars Base 1 mission here that we can launch. I'm not too sure if it's a good Mars Base 1, and I don't know if we're going to be intending to land any Kerbals at it just yet, but we might as well try it out. It definitely has a blater on it. It's actually got a heat shield of full ablator, which we don't need, but I decided not to edit so that we have something to do right now. We could launch this Mars Port 1, but its rollout time is two days, so I'll hold off on that and uh, we'll do that uh, last maybe uh, or even yeah we'll do that last uh, so here we go rolling out Mars Base 1 uh, I see a bit of a plot problem with this uh, Fiji 34 we've got a floaty nose cone problem that happens when you've got two procedural parts next to each other and well not this wasn't procedural but it actually had tweak scale on it so yeah, and that was purely because I had taken it into the VAB to check on the ablator on the heat shield for this. I, I probably should have fixed the nose cone at the same time, but I didn't see the nose cone I was looking at from this angle, and I didn't notice that one. Okay, well, I think we can still fly. Let's do the whole targeting the moon and everything. Okay, we are lined up, and we don't have a Fiji 3-4 launch script. I think the Fiji 2.4 should work just fine. So let's try that and hope for the best. Here we go. Ignition. F1 Wigglies. Launch. They wiggle a whole lot before the launch clamps release. Pretty sure the staging should go this way around. Oop, not that way that because we want the J2s to ignite first okay we are past the sound barrier and we have J2 ignition one minute into launch thrall down is not going to do anything now if we do happen to land at this Mars base there is food water and oxygen here and that could be used to extend the stay of the Kerbals on Mars. But that's a long shot. I haven't done enough testing. Oh, why did they go all spirally out? Not sure. Anyway, um, yeah, that's a long shot because I haven't done any testing on pinpoint landings on Mars, really. Maybe we should do that before I start trying to land stuff on Mars, but... The idea of uh, getting something at the same location as something else on Mars is tricky business because of the atmosphere. Easier on the moon, of course. Okay, for some reason our fairings did not decouple. I'm gonna blatantly assume that I'm gonna have to do it manually at this point. Okay, separation, and... Ignition. Come on, J2. Game is paused. Okay, we have it. Alright. Jeez. Moment of tension there. We need 2,300 meters per second. And that should leave us with 4,300 for the transfer. And then 1,200 in both the correction stage and the landing stage we have a full heat shield with full ablator there which we really don't need but hey we've got it now I hope the parachutes were uh, changed to Kevlar yes they are so Kevlar parachutes okay we are about to make orbit with the planned amount of Delta V left over and that should be more than enough in the time it took to just roll this out, the adjustments to the other other missions have already been done, so we're all set to go on everything else. There we go, shut down. 
and, well, let me plot for Mars. Okay, well, we've got our transfer uh, costing 3646 um, right now we I haven't uh, fine-tuned it yet and we're basically crashing into Mars but we'll deal with the particulars after we do the main burn now if I had waited just a little bit longer well not just a little bit longer like two weeks we could go on a faster trajectory uh, with uh, costing more Delta V like 4000 or so and on some missions that might be beneficial right now we're arriving in 283 days which is a long time uh, hopefully that means that when we arrive at Mars we're on a slow trajectory and we're going to arrive with minimal extra velocity so that the pass through the atmosphere is gentle and you know we've saw, seen that the big difference in the testing not that it matters on this one though since we have full ablator and everything is behind the heat shield in a sort of pod shape so should be okay and in fact the heat shield four meters and the payload in this case is uh, 14 tons that's a little bit heavier than the heaviest thing that we tested uh, in the in the testing phase but still uh, should not be a problem alright uh, make sure we settle the fuel down and here we go That's enough. Okay. Well, let's see what happened. Okay, well, we actually have an encounter. That's always nice. But it's still far away. So, as usual, we need the correction burn. But perhaps that's best done without the S4B stage. Possibly just the impulse from separation would have been enough to do that correction. But here we go, set. And let's make sure everything's unlocked, yes. Okay, well, let me do a replot. Okay, and nope, that's a crash course. Alright, well, RCS off. We'll have to do the fine tuning once we get over there. It's roughly the same pass that we have with the others. So that's good. But yeah, uh, we'll just adjust that once we get there. So add that alarm. 283 days. Everything will be coming in pretty close to each other. 283 there, 285, 288. Marsport 1, I believe, has enough ablator. The light lander might be in trouble, though. So we'll see. Uh, it's possible for it to make orbit on its own. And maybe it can rendezvous with the station and then we can send over some fuel for it on some other uh, transfer window. But yeah, I don't know if it can capture on its own safely. We'll see. Anyway, on to the next mission. This one is all set to go. Electric charge is diminishing right now, but that's because, that's because it's in the dark. It's got ample solar panels. All right. Okay, Fiji 3R1. And I believe this just runs on the Fiji 2R1 launch script. Handy. Very modular and everything. Okay, so it should work with the Fiji 2R1 launch script. So, okay, run Fiji 2R1. This is the UDMH depot. And you can see we have. 20% ablator on its heat shield, so that should be enough based on testing. The initial wiggle of the F1s is very disconcerting. I feel like we definitely want to light the center engine before the boosters go off. No, I'm I think maybe we can do it this way. It's probably fine. Ah, uh, that or everything will explode, one way or another. Okay. Ooh, ooh, that's quite a knock. Oh, can you catch it? Can you catch it, please? 
Oh, wow. That's not very efficient. Okay, but, but it's alright. It's alright. First try with this rocket. I think maybe we should definitely light this engine before decoupling the boosters. We'll have to change the script to accommodate that. Okay, I'm gonna risk fairing separation here before the stage runs out. Alright, and so we need 2,800 more to get into orbit. That leaves us 4,100 for the transfer, which based on our previous transfers should be enough with this stage. We are in space. Let me extend the panels. We've got more communication than we need on this little depot. And docking ports all over the place, so that it's a good thing to attach to a station, basically. And shut down, despite an awkward flip in the middle there. Well, not a real flip, uh, just a severe deviation, let's say. And that severe deviation probably gave us a little bit more inclination than I intended, but uh, we'll take it, and let me plot for Mars. Okay, we're all lined up with our maneuver. Everything is as normal with, just like all the other transfers so far. Uh, about 280 days over there. 281 for the Mars encounter. Okay, ignition. So this is the depot. If you didn't get a good look at it, it does have one of these Delta Avionics units. That's what's controlling the whole thing right now. Two of these Comtech antennae. Each one can has a range to communicate back to Earth from Mars and plenty of UDMH and N204 as you can see from the total delta V there especially after we get rid of the heat shield otherwise its engines are these S5.92 engines with 50 ignitions we've gone with uh, UDMH and N204 because the crew capsule the the Mars pod or Aries pod sorry Aries pod A will be using these same engines these S5.92 engines so, yeah, and so those are the engines that we're going to try and come back from Mars to Earth with. So this is extra fuel supply just in case the trip back requires a little bit of refueling. Unfortunately, our lander craft, the Lunapod G, not Lunapod G, it's based on Lunapod G, it's the Ares Pod G. The Ares Pod G runs on uh, Arizina and N204, so this isn't going to help it, but... Uh, if we're short of fuel on that, there's no particular way to help it because the fuel would have to be delivered on the ground. That's the only time we'll know when we don't have enough. Okay, we are on escape and getting ready for shutdown. Okay, that's shut down. We probably don't have an encounter just yet, though, because 7.3 meters per second... Let's see. Nope, no encounter just yet. So, a bit of RCS necessary. And naturally, we're going to need to make a bit of a correction, a radial burn, which means the timing was a little bit off. And proceed with the correction. It's always a fascinating fact that despite the extremely high velocities that we obviously transfer at, um, 20 meters per second is the difference between an actual encounter and, uh, not just an actual encounter, a low pass at Mars and missing it completely. Uh, so 20 meters per second, that's 44 miles an hour. And the difference between a high pass at Mars and a low pass at Mars is like a walking pace. Okay, that's a pretty good match right there. Yep, uh, we'll have to do an adjustment as usual to make sure that our periapsis is good for capture, but we have a dummy maneuver there for now. And add that to the alarm list. And this one is successfully on its way. Uh, UDMH Depot, 
that will ho hopefully make everything just a little bit safer for us. If it so happens that, for instance, on aero capture we lose the engines on the crude pod, for instance, that is a possibility, by the way, because they actually stick out uh, beside the heat shield instead of being covered by the heat shield. Um, this could rendezvous with the crude pod and give it the boost back home. So that is an option and one reason why we have this. So yeah, that's part of the plans. And it looks like we're good for that. Alright, so next thing. Okay, here we are with another light lander. We had already sent one, but that one didn't have a blater on the heat shield, I think. So this one does have 20% ablator, and that's good. So let's run PG2R1, and we are lined up with the moon. And also I should throw all down so that I don't take an extra ignition out of the J2. Okay, ignition, and launch. So unlike the Fiji 3R1, the 2R1 does not uh, wait until altitude to ignite the RD270. And that's why using the same launch script we had that problem with it dipping before igniting the RD270. So I'll need to make a custom launch script for that so that it ignites this first. Okay, and booster separation. All right, that's fine. We still have the recovery stuff on this one, though. But considering how Kerbal Construction Time works, I wonder if taking it off would have actually increased the time it takes to modify it. Okay, separation of that part, and then separation of the rest of the stage with ignition of the J2. And separation of the fairings. Okay. We need 3,600 to get to orbit, which should leave us enough to make the transfer on this stage. Okay, and orbit. Alright, and we have 3,900 meters per second left. So, that should be good enough. Let me plot for Mars once again. Third mission that we're sending over there in this episode. Well, I see a problem with this. I failed on symmetry with this solar panel. This has only got a solar panel on one side, which probably means it doesn't have all that much power, at least if a Kerbal's inside the lander can. If it's just the Agena avionics package, that should power down. But yeah, one solar panel is not good. On the other hand, we do have extra solar panels on this bit here, but that bit gets dumped eventually if we're going to land on somewhere. Well, I guess we'll extend them anyway. It'll still be with it while the heat shield is on, so... Though... The placement of that solar panel makes it look, look like it'll bump into the heat shield. And... Ignition. Probably a little bit late on that. Okay, getting ready for shutdown. And shut down. 4.1 off. Let's take a look at the situation. And that's pretty far off. <laughs> uh, I don't even see a little encounter there, so we probably overdid it quite a lot. Well, let's try and fix that. Alright, the correction burn was 70 meters per second. We did a little bit of extra RCS. Here's our Mar Mars periapsis of 202 kilometers. And I think we're good, uh, basically in line with everything else. That, that's pretty good that we're getting everything close to the same orbit, I think. And we're not going to be flat with respect to Phobos and Deimos just yet. We're going to need to do burns at Apoapsis. Uh, we have to capture high and do some corrections, I guess. It depends. I might have to... Maybe we should just aim at uh, sending or seek... Ascending or descending node to get to Phobos or Deimos for those parts of the mission. And it'll depend on whether these uh, light landers actually succeed. Because the light landers are critical to transferring our Kerbals to Phobos or Deimos if we want to do that part of the mission. 
So if the light landers get into orbit, then we need to consider um, inclination changes to better match the orbits of Phobos or Deimos. Otherwise, we don't need to do that. So yeah. Anyway, we've got that dummy node and the spacecraft is looking all right. 1.38 consumption in the dark. But once we time warp, I think the Agena core powers down. Let's just check. And then, of course, it should be fine once we hit daylight. Though the heat shield is obstructing some of the solar panels. Okay, yeah, we are recharging. So everything looks good. Of course, at Mars, the charge situation is going to be worse because, you know, less sunshine, less sunshine at Mars. But let's get this all settled. Okay, so here we are with the second Lunapod G. If you recall, the first Lunapod G got stranded in low Earth orbit because it didn't have enough fuel to go to Mars. And we're going to have a refueler try and meet up with that. But hopefully this time I've made enough adjustments that this will be able to make it to Mars. We'll find out. So, yep, uh, of course, this pod is required to land on Mars. And um, uh, maybe I should have gone with a larger launcher in retrospect, but of course, uh, now if I tried to add a booster, for instance, it would take too long and we would miss the window. So uh, we couldn't fix it up by adding a booster or something like that so I just changed uh, well I showed you what I did and marveled at how little time it took to make that adjustment in a previous episode so I'll just proceed from here uh, so this is a uh, Fiji 2R1 we are lined up and ready to go so run Fiji 2R1 basically a Fiji 2R1 is half of a Saturn V as far as mass is concerned I heard some interesting ignitions, but all right. It's a lot simpler, though, because altogether there's only four engines on the launcher. That's compared to 11 for Saturn V. All depends on how you take the whole RD-270 thing, though. Okay, and boosters are still twitching, but... There they go. All done with that, and proceeding. Not sure yet whether we have enough, of course. We did remove the recovery stuff from this one. Anything to get a little bit of extra Delta V. Okay, staging. And ignition of J2 is good. And let's see, we need 3,400 for orbit which leaves us with 4,000, so we should have enough this time. Thank goodness. Uh, well, let's not uh, jump the gun here. We'll see, and uh, we're pretty good on the relative inclination, well, as far as the moon is concerned. Um, of course, Mars is completely different, but it's a good start anyway. Still a long time before we actually make orbit. It's a 10-minute stage, so and we only have one minute to apoapsis, so there will be some severe tilting going on. Yep, 0.68 G's, and we're coming up on apoapsis, so it's going to be a close call one way or another. Whether we actually make orbit, I mean. Okay, well, we are dropping very quickly, but our vertical speed is tending towards zero, so that's good. Our margins are a little bit tighter now, obviously, since we've been deviating from prograde so much in order to get the time to do the burn. This definitely needs one more booster if we want to avoid this, but it might still make it, so... And if it makes it, that's, that's good, right? I mean, cheaper not to add another booster. Okay, we are about to make orbit here. So, all is well. So we're hoping not too lopsided. It's trying to control that. And it's a bit lopsided. Really lopsided. Okay, uh, all right, all right. I was gonna abort it, but uh, 460 by 160, not greatest, not the greatest, but 3,718 meters per second, just barely enough. All right, let's plot for Mars again. 
Okay, we're turning to the node now. Um, it's reading less delta V than we actually have because the nozzle is turned as we turn. But so we still have less than the 3,731 meters per second it now wants, about 13 meters per second less. And of course, we'll have to do a correction and all. Any correction we do with this will probably need to be done with the RCS rather than uh, the any sort of main engines because the main engines will be blocked by the heat shield. And the main engines will be the Gemini Lander engines. That's why there's a Luna, uh, Luna Pod or Ares Pod G. And those use the Ares Union N204. We are unfortunately burning out from close to our apoapsis. That's probably why it's costing more actually. Uh, because we're high up instead of at our periapsis. We're close to our apoapsis and that's not the most efficient way to go. So yeah, that hurt us. Okay, ignition. And we are once again on our way to Mars. Okay, getting ready for shutdown here. Well, it'll shut itself down, of course. Because we don't have enough fuel. That's sort of convenient. Okay, let's see. Probably we should decouple. It's not worth trying to use the fuel on board the S4B. Well, these little guys have... Uh, some time to do that. I should have locked the fuel up there though. You know what? It'd be good. Hold on. Uh, no, shut down, shut down. Stop, 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 stop. It'd be good to have the S4 stage crash into Mars. I mean, okay, contamination and everything, but whatever. Okay, so. Separation. Okay. I don't know if that part is still crashing into Mars. Let's find out. Uh, probably not. <laughs> um, probably not. Okay, that's a bit off, but I think maybe it'd be best to correct that over here. Let's see. Hmm, I wouldn't say best. Let me see if I can plot something out. Let's take a look at the at the vessel. So, I mean, it's exactly like our, our Luna pods, except uh, a little bit heftier, a little bit more fuel. Obviously, parachutes to make sure that it can come down safely. Let's double check Kevlar, 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 okay. And of course to dock and everything. Solar panels, let's get those out. And I think we have a reaction wheel, let's double check. Yeah, there's a small reaction wheel underneath the docking port right now. Always handy for landings. It does have a little antenna because we are controlling it remotely. So let's extend that. Oh, and the one on the other side too. Okay, that's a better approach. All right, I can deal with that. Stop all RCS stuff. Add maneuver, 276 days, so that's nice. Add that alarm. All right, well, I want to get it over with in this episode. Let's try and launch our two crew now. I think we've got enough stuff on the way. We've got an Ares Pod G here, the Delight Lander, Mars Base One even, UDMH Depot, another light lander which doesn't have a proper heat shield though, Mars Port 1. So we certainly flung a lot of things to Mars ahead of them. So let's let's fling them now. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, here we are at long last, the launch you've been waiting for. And with uh, Felipe Kerman and or Philippe Kerman and Newcast Kerman, they're both pilots. I decided uh, Newcast is new, and uh, Philippe, of course, has had a lunar mission before. And we are on uh, Saturn V equivalents, though with upgraded engines. And let's hope for the best here. I'll load the script. Actually, you know what? Let's load it into the Saturn instrument unit. And you can see our current ablator situation. The location that had a ablator that I didn't really want a ablator on is this a big Gemini passenger compartment. So what we've got is we've got a Gemini capsule, a uh, regular one. We've got a uh, lunar rated heat shield, Soyuz heat shield actually. Um, and then we have the big Gemini passenger compartment. As in the MOL manned orbital laboratory situation, they would have to pass through... Um, 
a trap door in the heat shield in order to get into the passenger compartment. There are no passengers. The reason for the passenger compartment is simply extra uh, living space for them. It's not a whole lot, but it's efficient. So at least they'll have some extra space. It's pretty horrible, honestly. But they just needed to, for the 180 days, or actually probably more, more than 200 days, out to Mars. After that, hopefully a station will rendezvous with them and they can use the station space for the remainder of the time until they have to come back, in which case on the way back they're gonna be stuck in here again. I thought about launching another Saturn V with uh, more crew space, uh, inflatable module or something like that, that's possible. And what would happen there is uh, this plus its S4B would dock with uh, the living space, the inflatable module, with its S4B and then one S4B would uh, complete like the first third of the transfer or maybe a little bit more than that and then the second S4B would finish off the transfer to Mars. It's better to do that than to launch this into a high orbit and then have the habitat rendezvous or, uh, or the opposite because um, either one of those other scenarios probably entails them spending a lot of time in the Van Allen belts. I'm explaining all this up front because uh, the engines are going to be pretty loud and I don't want to talk over them. So here we go. Let's hope for a good launch of the Fiji 551. We're a little bit over the mass of a Saturn V because these are better engines and uh, probably a little bit more massive engines but not a whole lot more than a normal Saturn V. And off it goes. You probably noticed it on a previous Fiji 551 launch, but I also did not put the fins on the Saturn V or Fiji 551. We just skipped those. So yeah, the big Gemini passenger compartment had full ablator before. I just took off its ablator and moved it to the heat shield that we already had there. Yeah, I left a little bit of ablator just in case, you never know. So this is actually the return vessel from Mars. It'll cap use the heat shield to capture into orbit, and then this is meant to come back. It has the food, water, and oxygen. We can take a look at the life support situation. Two years and 210 days is what I budgeted for this mission. And as far as I know, that's exactly what we need. We don't have any recyclers. We need more science to unlock those. Okay, we have center engine cutoff as planned. And ignition of the second stage. All right. We're still looking good. Okay, staging. And we have enough fuel. Just come on, game. Allow the third stage to do its thing. Oh. Okay. Ah, we loaded it into this core, and that's not good. All right. Uh, my bad, if you will. And we took an extra ignition then. Yeah, I had actually moved the Stat Saturn instrument unit down a stage in order to accommodate this payload so that we had enough, uh, had enough capacity. Just for safety's sake, I mean, we obviously have 4,000 to transfer to Mars and we don't need all 4,000, but I felt it was prudent. So I should have loaded it up in the Gemini capsule instead. Okay, and shut down. 229 by 178. And we're going to have to be extra careful because we only have one ignition now on the J2. J2S actually, but 4,100 meters per second, so we have enough to transfer. Let's make it happen. All right, we have our plot. We are settling the fuel down here. Okay, it is very stable. We have enough delta V. And 
ignition. Trans Mars injection underway. Okay, we are a touch late on the burn, but hopefully it won't be too far off. Arriving at the node before reaching the halfway point in the burn. Okay, we are on escape now. Getting ready for shutdown. These will be our first Kerbals to really leave Earth's, uh, Earth's sphere. I mean, of course, technically going to the moon is leaving Earth's sphere of influence, but this feels a little bit more definite. And shutdown. Okay, 1.3 off on the shutdown, but let's see what our situation is. We do seem to have an encounter. That's good. We really need electric charge soon, and that means extending the solar panels. We have a lot of those. They're not particularly arrayed in the way I would most like them to be, but... I think it'll be safer just to replot and do so after we separate off from the S4 stage. S4-ish stage, I suppose. So this is our little package. Um, that is just uh, fuel for the journey to Mars. And then we have a heat shield here with 20% ablator. Uh, these are the engines that uh, we will be most worried about if maybe uh, they decide to blow up on us, but that's why we have the UDMH depots heading out. Let's extend the solar panels. Again, they're not in the greatest position because uh, they'll they'll look somewhat odd when extended. But I had no other place to put them that wouldn't be weird. And we can get rid of that cone. So we'll probably have to sidestep it and everything. Okay, so let me plot a little correction. Right now we have 2,961 meters per second. And uh, some of that is in this can here. In total, let's see. Oh, it doesn't show us what's going to happen after we get rid of it. But I think we have about 2,400 in the main bit. And we have food, water, and oxygen here. If we quickly plot the journey back home from Mars to Earth, no insertion burn. Yeah, okay, we have two plots here. Uh, 666 days and 669 days, those are transfers back. And basically 2,100 meters per second is all we need. So that's what we need to keep. And so we've got 800 meters per second to play around with, and that's it. Now this is pretty darn heavy. Uh, this is a 5 meter heat shield and this is way more than the 15 tons that I tested in those testing videos. So I'm gonna have to go in separately and check out how this sort of thing needs to be captured. But also we are on a very slow 9 month transfer to Mars. So that's something else to, to take into consideration. We haven't even tested a 9 month transfer. All right, let me do the correction uh, for Mars, and we'll make sure that Philippe and UCAS are correctly on their way. Okay, well, it looks like the correction we need is a mere 11 meters per second, so we'll do it with RCS. So altogether, there's 20 minutes of fuel, and it, won't, it isn't really 48 tons on this heat shield, of course. There's this tank here, and this tank is, well, it's got about half the fuel in that tank. Then there's our food, water, and oxygen. Probably we've lowered this heat shield up with about 30 tons. Maybe a little bit more than that. So just for reference though, our Fiji 551 managed to toss 48 tons to Mars. On a good transfer window. This only was uh, 3,700 meters per second. It can cost more than 4,000 to get to Mars. So not at all transfer windows would this have worked. But with the upgraded F1As and the J2Ss, we managed this. 
I think we can correct the rest once we enter Mars SOI. That is roughly the same approach. And it should be a trivial, yeah, it will be a trivial burn once we get there to fix it up just like the other ones. But yeah, now I feel like I need to do some additional Mars entry testing with something with this mass loading, which is heavier than what I had been testing with. Okay, as I was saying, adding the alarm. 271 days for the transfer there. And so it'll get ahead of the Ares Pod G. This will actually be the first to arrive. And then Ares Pod G, Light Lander, Mars Base 1, UDMH Depot, Light Lander, uh, Mars Port 1. And we still have a few more launches that we can do. Uh, we've got another UDMH Depot, another Mars Port 1, the Hydrolox Refueler to uh, fix up the alternate Ares Pod G that is currently stranded in low Earth orbit. And then we can uh, send over the stuff for Jupiter, which uh, need to go in six days. Yep, uh, it's heady times here. Uh, the way back, by the way, the trip home is still something that takes a long time. 253 days, it says. So hopefully we can cut that down a bit. That's a long travel time. We have 942. <laughs> that's that's how tight I, I plan this. Uh, if you do the math, um, th this transfer is in uh, 16, 666 days plus it will take 255 days to get back. That's 921. But this, this other one here... No, I, I miscalculated initially. We've got 20 days of spare food, water, and oxygen. Isn't that lovely? So, yeah. Basically, we had better get back on those transfers, but it's looking good. At least we've got this much going for us that everything needed to get back is right here. We've got the food, water, and oxygen. We've got the fuel. And we don't have to rendezvous with anything else at all in order to return. Okay, there's the sun. Okay, we're recharging uh, finally. And we certainly don't have our solar panels in an ideal position to recharge. So that's good. At least we're recharging as long as the sun's there. Phew, though. That's, that's tough. And I don't know what the situation around Mars will be. After all, Mars will be blocking the sun for part of the time, too. So that's another consideration that I might not have done enough thinking about. All right, but for now, they're on their way, they're recharging, they've got their stuff. Let's hope for the best. So on that note, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like, and I'll see you next time.